Hello, you cool cats and kittens. It's Carol Baskin, and you are listening to Fascination Street. <laughs> I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with actor Peter Jason. Peter has been in nearly 100 movies and well over 100 TV shows. Most notably on the TV show front, he played Con Stapleton on 26 episodes of Deadwood, and he played Uncle Jim on the FX series Baskets with Louie Anderson. As far as the movies, oh my gosh, it's all the movies from your childhood, man. We got 48 Hours, Mommy Dearest, Angel, The Karate Kid, Dreamscape, Brewsters, Millions, Heartbreak Ridge, even Alienation, and They Live, which I get confused in my head all the time. In this episode, we talk about some of that stuff. He tells some really cool stories about working with Louie Anderson working with Frank Marshall and working with Walter Hill. And he even tells a really funny story about Max von Sydow. And then we talk about his new film, Deep in the Forest, released by Saban Films, which comes out tomorrow, May 31st, on VOD Everywhere. Not only does it star Peter Jason, it also stars last week's guest, Stuart Pankin. We talk all about the movie, no spoilers, and it sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see it myself. Go check it out. It's tomorrow on VOD Everywhere, Deep in the Forest. And this is my conversation with veteran actor and all-around good guy, Peter Chasen. Steve, what's going on over there? Be here. What's going on, my man? Well, I don't know how many uh, how many of these things I have to hit before I can get you. Eleven. Eleven things. Well, uh, I got it on the uh, third. No. Oh. Well, I'm wrong. <laughs> Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Peter Jason. How are you doing today, man? Today happens to be a good day for me. Thank you very much for asking. You're welcome for asking, and is you made it sound like that's unusual. Every day is a miracle, you know, just uh, you wake up and you go, hey, I'm alive. Isn't this exciting? (laughs) Love it. All right. So I want to start with all of the things. And by all of the things, I mean, where were you born and raised? Where'd you grow up? I was born in Hollywood. I grew up down on the beach down in Balboa, California, Newport Beach, California. I was a surf bum for the first 18 years, and then I became an actor bum. (laughs) Why? Because I walked out on stage, and uh, my first play, The Man Who Came to Dinner at Newport Harbor High School, I was playing uh, the lead, uh, which was uh, Sheridan Whiteside. I walked out, stood up out of my wheelchair, and they exploded into applause, and I went, oh, I like this. Never looked back. Really? That was the defining moment? Never had a job. Never worked for a living. Just played the rest of my life. Well, how does that grab you? What did your parents think about that decision? They hated the idea. My dad drove me down to the desert, spend the night at a place down in uh, Indian Wells. And he said, you know, your mom and I are talking. You were really good in that play. You were wonderful. Everybody loved you. You probably think you want to be an actor now. And well, your mother and I will support you in any anything you do. But uh, we want to let you know we're totally against it. <laughs> <laughs> he emphasized that several times before he said, you know, but whatever you want to do, we're rooting for you. And uh, I just continued to act. I just looked for every acting school, acting workshop, acting repertory theater, summer stock company, any place I could work. It didn't matter for free, for food, for whatever I could just to play good parts. I didn't want to be a spear carrier. I wanted to act. I figured, you know, I've, I've even said it on my website that we want to learn to be a good car mechanic. You work on a lot of cars. So you want to be a good actor, you work in a lot of plays, a lot of movies, a lot of films, a lot of TV, a lot of whatever. So you're saying just do it. Just do it. Or as uh, Billy Zane uh, has a T-shirt that he made and gave me one, uh, it says, just have it done. (laughs) Got the Nike swatch on it, you know. Of course. (laughs) Just do it. Just have it done. (laughs) So, Peter, there's not a whole lot of people born in Hollywood, man. I think I can count them on one finger. (laughs) 
ground that you know. In fact, the hospital I was born in is burned down. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital on uh, Western burned down. I went to get my passport thing, you know, my birth certificate. And uh, they said, oh, you got to go to Sacramento for that, for the capital. And uh, Hollywood Presbyterian moved up the street. It's out now on Sunset Boulevard. It's called Children's Hospital, connected with Hollywood Press. But that's where I was born in Hollywood. My grandmother lived here. My dad was over fighting the Nazis. So we had to wait till uh, he came home to move down to uh, Balboa. Wow. Well, thanks, uh, Peter's dad. I appreciate what you did there. Fist fighting Nazis. That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) My wife had that same problem when we went to get her a passport a few years ago. The hospital that had burned down also and all the records were gone. And it was the biggest pain in the ass to get her a passport it was insane the amount of hoops that we had to jump through you had to go to dallas or something where did you have to go to austin what's the capital austin austin's the capital but we were living in louisville at the time so it was just this crazy since we didn't have her original birth certificate i had to like bust some weird shit out of her baby book and send in like the doctor's bill and wow like the birth announcement it was weird as shit The little bracelet that they put on the baby, you know, that says, this is the Peter Jason baby. Uh I had to send that in. Like, it was weird, the stuff I had to send in. But we got it taken care of. So I'm glad you were able to just go to Sacramento (laughs) and get it done. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Jason has been in nearly 100 movies, over 100 TV shows, most notably uh, on the TV show front. I think most notably probably that's this is what you get recognized for the most is um playing con stapleton on 26 episodes of deadwood is that what people notice you the most that's what they recognize me from recently sure if i were to say over my career of 56 years the thing i get recognized most for is the bartender in 48 hours with eddie murphy isn't that crazy it was such a memorable role for Eddie, too, it launched his career. It was his first movie, and he was very nervous. And everyone thinks, oh, you guys must have ad-libbed that whole scene. And Walter Hill wrote every word, word for word, in that scene. Is Walter Hill pretty stick-to-the-script kind of guy? He, he usually writes his own scripts. I've done 14 movies with the guy, and he's my guy. He and John Carpenter and Frank Marshall uh, are pretty much half my career. You say, Walter, I got a great idea. What if, what if I said blah, 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 blah? And he goes... Oh, that's a great idea. No. (laughs) They always tell you what a great idea it was. (laughs) How did you get hooked up with Walter Hill? I mean, apparently he loves the work you do and you guys work well together. You know, Craig Marshall and I grew up together down in Newport and I was up here, you know, trying to get a job, trying to get a job and trying to stay, keep my head above water without becoming a waiter or something. I never had to do that. And Frank calls me and he says, uh, you need a job? I said, yeah. He said, do you need uh, to know any more about it? I said, no. He said, all right, <laughs> come on down to the uh, train, Union train station downtown LA. I'm doing this movie called The Driver, starring uh, Ryan O'Neill and uh, Isabella Ajani and Bruce Dern. And I said, great. And he said, Walter Hill's directed. Come on down. And so I went down there and walked up with and Frank met me and we walked up to the director and, and he said, well, Walter, this is uh, Peter Jason. He's a uh, guy I th- thought would, could play that part. And he said, yeah, okay, great. Get him dressed and get him out of here. <laughs> and I played that part. And actually, Walter wanted to shoot the back of my head on the Bruce Dern with the money, a bag of money and stuff that was happening. But he didn't want to see my face. He just wanted the back of my head and my hands holding the money. But I kind of kept turning into the cam- camera and Walter was going, will you stop turning into the camera? They're going to see your face. I said, well, that's what I want him to do. I said, I'm, a, I'm a movie actor. I want him to see my face. He said, I don't want him to see your face. I want him to see the back of your head. And I said, wow, okay. Well, I keep kind of... I kept trying to turn it in a little bit, you know. He thought that was pretty funny. So he kept hiring me job after job, you know. He hired me for 48 hours and Brewster's Millions. Deadwood, he hired me for Deadwood. He shot the pilot of Deadwood. A lot of other, you know, 12 other movies. Some of the biggest movies of my childhood, including like we talked about 48 Hours, you were in Mommy Dearest. Angel? Nobody even remembers Angel. Nobody ever talks about that movie. That's a terrible movie. That's why. You know, so. 
But Angel, my agent called me and said, you know, they're going to give you a chunk of change here for one day's work. He told me about the script. And I went, ah, high school honor student by day, hooker by night. I don't think I'm, I'm playing the John. I'm going to pick her up and take her in the bathroom. And I don't want to do that. I said, who's in it? And he said, blah, 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 Slim Pickens. I said, Slim Pickens is in the movie? Oh, my God. I'll take it. You know, <laughs> I wanted to meet Slim Pickens, you know. And did you? So I go to work and I'm looking around. Where, where's Slim Pickens? Where's Slim Pickens? And the AD comes over and he says, oh, he died of a brain hemorrhage two days ago. Rory Calhoun is playing his part. And I went, oh, my God, no, he died? And Rory Calhoun, I worked with in uh, The Blue and the Gray with Stacey Keach. And Rory Calhoun is a great guy. In fact, he told me this great story one time. We were flying to do The Blue and the Gray down to Dallas-Fort Worth and then over to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we were shooting a movie. We're at the airport in between planes. We're sitting there, and he said, what are you going to drink? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe a beer. He says, order a vodka martini up with an olive. I said, okay, why? He said, that's what I used to drink. He says, I'm, I, I can't drink anymore. My stomach was a cut. I'm not allowed to have that anymore. So, but I'd love to see you enjoy it. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll have a vodka martini up with an olive, please. <laughs> and we're sitting there, he's sipping on a lemonade and, and we're talking back and forth. And then all of a sudden, two old ladies come walking across the lobby of the, the airport there and walking right at us. And we're like the only ones there. And uh, they come walking right straight at us. And he goes, oh, boy, watch this. He, I said, what? He said, just watch. And they came walking up and they said, excuse me, didn't you used to be Rory Calhoun? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, I'm now Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> and they were scratching their head there going, what the hell are you talking about? Didn't you used to be? Didn't you oh my used gosh. to be Rory Calhoun? That is insane. So back to your phenomenally impressive body of work. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Brewster's Millions, I've probably seen 40 or 50 times. It hit me right at that sweet spot of, you know, whatever age. I love everything about that movie, man. So needless to say, I grew up with you. I mean, Heartbreak Ridge, Karate Kid, Alienation, and They Live, which for some reason I get both of those movies confused with each other all the time, and I have no idea why. Maybe it's because you were in both of them. <laughs> I don't know. Well, one had cone heads and, and one had ghouls. Ghouls. Well put. Uh, recently, you also worked with the late, great Louis Anderson when you played Uncle Jim on baskets Peter, come over here and talk to my brother in minnesota come here he wants to know what you're wearing in this scene louis was oh my god he was a sweetheart i'd actually worked with him years before 20 years before on uh remington steel no shit i played a rich hustler and he played a rich kid and i'm trying to sell him some uh bogus caviar but we're riding polo ponies. I mean, that's comedy right there, you know, golden comedy right there. Louis Anderson getting on a polo pony. And <laughs> when I went to do <laughs> baskets, I came walking into the audition and he just won the Emmy. So he was on top of the world. And I walked in. I hadn't seen him in 25 years, maybe. I walked in. He goes, hey, I know you. And I went, yeah, we did a Remington Steel together many moons ago. Oh, yeah. I bet that horse remembers me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. gosh. He was the best. <laughs> what a great dude. What a great dude. Treated everybody like family. That show was the family. The people he brought into it. And Jonathan Crisell, the uh, producer, director, writer of it, was like the papa, and, and Louis was the mama. And Zach played two roles, twins, and Zach was, he's just so much fun to play with. We do it by the script. We do the scene by the script the first time, maybe the second time. Then uh, uh, Jonathan would say, all right, go. <laughs> and Louis and Zach were just so adept at improvisation. I mean, they would take off 
And all you could do was try to jump on a horse and, and, and ride and, and catch up with them. You know, they would, they would fly and these improvisations and they were so much fun to play with that it was, wasn't even going to work. You know, it was just going to the playground. That's fantastic. And you did quite a few episodes of that as well. I know you can't say, you know, you can't be very specific, but I'm going to assume that that is one of the most fun sets you've been on recently, just because of all the people involved and the welcoming nature that you're explaining as far as the family. You don't have to say it, but I'll just assume that's the most fun you've had on set in some time. Which one? Baskets. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's very seldom that they let you play that much. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, I, that's what I'm here for. You know, I played sports the first 18 years of my life, and I played acting the next, uh, you know, 60 years of my life. That's my favorite place to be on the set. And when, when there's a director or a, uh, a star that makes it not fun, and there are some, you know, that they take all the fun out of it, suck the air out of the room, as they say. You know, it's you want to hang out in your trailer, read. But most of the time, they've been brought up through the ranks, through stage acting uh, into the movies, and they respect the process. They respect the creation of the family. Holding the family together is everybody's job. Everybody has a piece of that. Everybody has a part of the work. It, the cast and crew all help to make this thing happen. And in movies, it's a huge cast and crew sometimes. And it's hard getting them all on the same page, but a good director knows how to do that. Walter Hill, Frank Marshall, uh, uh, John Carpenter, they hire with that in mind. You know, a lot of times people that they've worked with before, sometimes new people, but people that are going to be copacetic with, look at us, not look at me. That's amazing. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Contact D is the new movie from me, Vincent Caldoni. When therapist Jay Rossi is assigned a patient who claims to have been abducted by aliens, her story wins him over. Her tales begin to take on an aura of truth rather than insane delusion, and he concocts a plan to confront the alien intelligence. He absconds with her to a cabin in the mountains to document the phenomenon, prove that she is not crazy. But see, here's the thing. Messing with an otherworldly intelligence proves to be more dangerous than either Jay or his patient could have ever foreseen. Contact D is a heady thriller, more focused on ideas than CGI and loaded with twists. For more details, visit contactdmovie.com. Let's get back into it. Uh, you know, I, I, the rules, it's the people who break the rules are the ones who actually make their mark. I mean, I, I love the working with the Cohen brothers. They break all the rules, but they're but they break them in a little sandbox all their own. He's, was it uh, Joel said, uh, or maybe it was Ethan in an interview that, that Hollywood gives them a little uh, corner of the sandbox and lets them play over there all alone and leaves them alone. <laughs> alone. They get their final cut. They get all the things they want, but they're over there in the little corner playing and nobody bothers them. And then they release their movie. So they, I don't know how many movies they've made, but a lot. They're all interesting. Some are great. Some are not so great, but they're all their movies. They all got their hand mark on them. You know, I mean, when you look at Fargo, where those characters came from, oh my God, they're still coming in that TV series. But when they made that movie and Francis played that cop, it was just so much fun to watch him. You know, the same thing with the Miller's Crossing, the same thing with Barton Fink. And uh, uh, I did Hail Caesar with them. And I just love the characters in that. And the, and the, the one after that, the, the singing cowboy, forget the name of it right now, but they just had so many great movies, those guys. I, I, I loved working with them. And their process is, you know, some of these guys have a, have a way of working that you can kind of see and you can kind of admire from afar. One of the reasons I think the Coen brothers are so successful is preparation. They prepare so far in advance for their stuff. They were making my wardrobe three months before I was going to work. And I came in for a fitting two months before I went to work. And the preparation is the deal with them. Nothing is lost on them. They do it all in advance. So there's no surprises. And when you get up there, if there is a surprise, they're so prepared, they can deal with it. It's the ones that throw it together at the last minute that all of a sudden, you know, the gun goes off and they shoot the cinematographer. Oof. You know, these are not 
well-planned shoots. I've been on a few of them. You don't want to be on one of those. The great thing about Frank Marshall is a lot of movies you're on. At the end of the day, we're losing the light to right. We got to go. We got to get a shoot. Hurry up. Get it over here. Let's shoot it. And, and something breaks or something falls apart or somebody gets hurt or we don't get the shot or whatever it is. And they're racing and racing and racing to do it. Frank Marshall's set. He goes, hey, the sun's going down. All right. See you all tomorrow. <laughs> so you don't have to end the expense of reshoots. You know, nobody gets hurt. Nothing gets broken. Nobody dies. But Frank has that Newport Beach, Balboa disposition. He's a beach kid, you know, and I'm a beach kid. Beach kids are easy to be around. They're, it's okay. Everything's fine. Laid back surfer dudes. The fish are jumping and the cotton is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Out of curiosity, uh, my own particular curiosity, why did you adopt a stage name? Your given name is pretty unique. I'll tell you a story about my name, too. When I was newly acting, I was 21. I walked into a, uh, an office in, at 20th Century Fox, and, oh, shoot, what's his name now? He's over in the actor's home. He's a, he was a great casting director for years and years. I'll come up with it. But he said, you know, you got to change your name. Nobody can spell it. And I said, oh, okay. And the night before, I'd just seen Long Day's Journey with Sir Ralph Richardson and Catherine Hepburn and Jason Robards and Dean Stockwell. And I said, oh, okay, I'll change it to uh, Jason Robards. <laughs> he said, but Jason's a good name for you. And I said, okay, I'll be Peter Jason. He said, no, no, I mean Jason for a first name. I said, no, Jason will be my last name. I'll be Peter Jason. And he goes, well, that's a good name. Take that. And I took that. It's still not legally mine. On my driver's sure. license, on my passport, still Peter Osling. But when I worked with Max von Sydow in a movie called Dreamscape, I, I kill Max von Sydow in that movie. Uh, I worked for Christopher Plummer, and he sends me and Chris Mulkey off to kill Max. And uh, on the first day we meet Max, God, I, I thought he'd be this frail old man, you know. But I walk up to him, and he grabs my hand, and he, like, engulfs it with this huge ham hock. Wham! And he grabs it. Oh, good to meet you. Good to meet you. And, like, and I'm like, gee, this guy's going to break my hand. And he, I said, you know, I'm Swedish. And he goes, what's your name? And I said, Ostling. He goes, no. I said, yeah. He goes, no. How do you spell it? And I said, O-S-T-L-I-N-G. He goes, no. Auslund. Little rolling hills with trees. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I go, what do you mean? He said, in Sweden, all the, all the teachers, and my father's side of the family, they're all teachers. All the teachers come from Auslund, where the university is, Auslund. And uh, I've not been there, but I'd love to go. Uh, that was the name. And when, during the famine happened, and they all came here to America, when they got to Ellis Island, Auslund was like Smith. So it was like they changed to Oster, Ooster, Eastman, Ostlin, Eastland, Ostling. We got Ostling. And uh, Max told me that. And I went home and asked my dad. And he said, yeah, that's right. So then I didn't feel too bad about changing my name. It had already been changed. <laughs> yeah. What's stopping you from going? You said you haven't been there. Why not? Sweden? Yeah. Well, I've never, I've never done a movie. They haven't invited me to over there to do a movie. I like to go places where they invite me. You know, you can go places where they don't pay you you can, if they call them vacations you don't have to work all the time man you can go yeah, places where you don't work how, how fun could that be <laughs> <laughs> okay now we're gonna get to the meat of it ladies and gentlemen streetwalkers if you will streetwalkers just like last week when we were talking to the wonderful and i'm assuming one of your best friends Stuart pankin never heard of him you, you, Peter, are in the upcoming Deep in the Forest, released by Saban Films. As a matter of fact, it comes out tomorrow on VOD everywhere. Did Stuart tell you that it comes from Deep in the Forest? You will meet no friends. No, he didn't. Yes. It's a quote from a famous novel by Blitter Batashimaga. Really? Yeah. I think that guy was Swedish. I think he was Russian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Deep in the Forest by Saban Films. Like I said, it comes out tomorrow, May 31st on VOD everywhere. Tell me about this film, man. I hear you're the president of a small democratic club. Well, yeah, it's kind of like uh, what's going on in, in America today, you know? It's kind of split down the middle, and uh, the far right becomes quite violent, and they start making people disappear. 
and especially on the left. In this democratic organization, this democratic club that we have, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but several of the members start disappearing. And so we have to do something about it. So I kind of take charge and I do something about it. But I don't want to tell you what, because I want you to see the movie. Well, I also want to see the movie. Do you get to slap anybody? (laughs) No, I wait till they give us the award. Oh, shit. (laughs) And then I just walk up, thank the Academy and slap myself. There you go. Well done. You know, someone's going to do that. It'll probably be next year. Yeah. I know they will. They have to, right? They have to. Just to, you know, take the weight off of the deal. Ugh, that's so gross. So where did you guys film this? I know you filmed this. This was probably like the last thing you did before pandemic shut everything down, right? It was. I did a couple of commercials and a couple of little things after that, but all in-house and mostly uh, Zoom uh, oriented. And uh, I did one with Danny Houston, which I, I really love. It was called We Are Gathered Here Today. And I play the patriarch of a huge family, COVID, and go in and I die within a week. And I'm in the hospital because I don't wear a mask and I don't believe any of that shit. But while I'm dying, the whole family gets together and all these Zoom calls all around me, you know, all the secrets come out, all the secrets of the family. Oh, shit. I love doing that. But we did that on Zoom. Zoom is still has not been, as you can see here today, has not been look at the color of you and look at the color of me and, and different sounds and uh, it hasn't been finely tuned yet, as they say. Yes. I'm sure it will be. I was on the original, for, I believe it was the first time they ever did film and tape together. It was a Hallmark Hall of Fame called A Bell for Adano, starring John Forsyth. Outside was the film and inside was the tape. And when they put them together, it was night and day. It did not sync. It looked horrible. And it was a failure, literally visual failure and sound failure. But here it is 50 years later, and we've been using tape and film together and painting them and making them match so they look absolutely beautiful together. So Zoom is going to be fixed up here in a minute, and uh, we're all going to be fine. I I don't know. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I got away from that question. What was that question? (laughs) Well, my question was, tell me about your time on the set. Uh, Where did you guys film it? Oh, we shot it? Over, over there. No, my friend, Mary Radford, who was uh, Frank Marshall's assistant for many, 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 many years, Mary Radford, she took it upon herself to help us. And uh, she found some locations. But the main location was this old fallen apart house way out in Simi Valley up on a hill overlooking a beautiful view. There's some shots of me on the balcony and the whole gang. Everybody has been seen looking over this valley. And it was in Simi Valley. We all lived in that house. It was freezing cold. We had a fire in the fireplace at all times where everyone was covered around. It was a creaking old, almost fallen apart place. Lunch was scary at that place. Scary? (laughs) It wasn't like in Texas where you can have chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes and gravy and, and cream corn, which is one of my favorite meals of all time. Every time I go there, that's the first thing I order. It's in Simi Valley on cold mornings and cold afternoons, and lunch was not fun. But the, so the location was not fun. But the people were fun, and we had a great time holding each other, keeping each other warm. And that, that, that location served very well for the movie because there's a little creepiness in the movie. And this place was creepy. And there's a little throwback in time part of this movie is – and hideaway in this movie. And this place had hideaways in it. Oh, wow. I can't give you all the info, but uh, sure, it's what's happening today. And it has an end, I hope. Like, I hope we have an end, a good, happy ending. I hope, I hope the movie has a happy ending. I'm not really sure if I'm allowed to say what happens there. The people I worked with were beyond compare. And also Stuart Pankin was there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stuart Pankin, I've done many things together and we get along so well he even played my wife in a movie we've we have nothing but fun so much hopelessly in june check it out he's a great woman oh like louis but ursula brooks and her husband derwin jordan give great performances in it you got uh larry cedar wendy worthington she was fabulous pj auckland celia scott roger mayer Ava Brahmian, who everybody fell in love with. 
And uh, what's our kid's name? Our little kid's name. I forget our kid's name. What is our kid's name? I forget. You have to see the movie. I forget her name. And I forget what I had for breakfast. Oh, Stuart probably remembered her name, didn't he? No. He had a really hard time coming up with all of the names. It was really funny. It was hilarious. He said, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read you all these names. And then he was trying to pronounce a name and trying to pronounce a name. And, try, and I was like, can you? Are you? Can you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you were in the movie with them? Well, you don't call them by their names on the set. You call them by their character names. So, you know, you get to know them under that name. Stewie was just shithead. You know, that's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said you guys are really, really good friends. Once again, everybody, May 31st, that's tomorrow. It's on VOD everywhere. It's called Deep in the Forest. And it, of course, stars Peter Jason and last week's guest, Stuart Pankin. Go check it out. VOD everywhere. Tomorrow, May 31st. Peter, where can people find you on social media? You mean like a face plant and all that stuff? Uh huh. I'm on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Insta, Insta feed, Insta groove, Insta, Insta. Everybody, go find it or scroll down in the show notes, and you'll see them there as well. I'm on tick tick boom, tick tick boom. You have a website, right? What is that? I do. Peterjason.net. You can go to that and see uh, what I've been doing for two years on the pandemic. Two years? That's it? That's all you got on there? Well, no, I have stuff before that. But I mean, what I've been doing for the last two years is making art. Oh, sweet. I can't wait to go see that. I recycle wood and turn them into treasures. Really? We just bought a birdhouse about a month ago that is is all recycled wood and, and bits and bobs and things. It's really cool. I can't wait to see what kind of art you come up with, man. That's neat. Well, when they wouldn't let you act, you got to have some outlet. Yeah. So my wife kicks me out to the house. She goes, go out in the backyard and play. So I go out there and play. Don't come home until the streetlights are on. <laughs> don't, don't come home until they turn the streetlights <laughs> on. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Peter, as we're winding out here, is there anything I didn't ask you or we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about today? Man, did I miss anything? Well, you know, you're very thorough uh, in your research. You hit post all the hot spots. What you missed, we'll get on on the next one. Word. I love it. Peter Jason. We'll see you in the movies. Uh, we'll see you at the movies. Oh, ah, that's right. I'm in one. One. You're just in the one. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic recycling wood art project schedule to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. And you have a great rest of your week. Let's see if I can figure out how to say goodbye. Well, you use your mouth, not your fingers. <laughs> Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening. <laughs>